All right. I'm going to have my what about Bob moment. Uh, All right. This man, this man, this, this saint of, uh, this, pa this patron saint of e-commerce in China, yeah. who is Frank Lavin. Yeah. Uh, this is his book. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm razzing him, but uh, this is a really good book. And, and okay. Craig, yeah. But, but look, Craig, here's the point. Thank you for that. Interview. Here's the point. Any brand in the U.S., any brand in the world is familiar with and comfortable with the idea of domestic e-commerce. And the they brands will tell you, look, 20% of our business, 40% of our business comes online and we're on Amazon. We have our own platform. We're on Etsy. We have seven other verticals we're into and we've got a whole e-commerce department, a whole social media department. So they get it. They get it. That, that, that battle's over and e-commerce has won. And then when you say, well, what are you doing internationally in e-commerce? You get a range of responses from nothing to, well, we got something going in Mexico, we just started, or we're working with a partner in France. So there's episodic things. What The point of this book is to say, look, if you've got something going well in the United States, and if it's working for you in e-commerce, there is a very good chance it will work for you in China. And the reason you can be so confident about that, so bullish about that, is because of the numerical base, that the China e-commerce market is larger than the US e-commerce market. So even if you say, well, there's cultural gaps, there's language gaps, there's limited familiar, even if you discount it, you say, you know, you can reasonably uh, uh, successfully hit five, 10, 15, 20% of your US sales in China. And if you're really good, you can go above that. But even if you're just sort of hitting baseline numbers. So the real question is, if all you had in China was a pure play e-commerce strategy, and all you did in China was hit 10% of your US sales, would you be happy? Most brands would say, heck yeah, that's a 10% lift in my revenue for you know just doing nothing, just for replicating what I'm already doing in a new market, right? Because the base in China is so large. And the second interesting point is US brands really dominate that premium space, the Nike space, the Starbucks space, because our mass market culture is in that premium good space. The China indigenous brands are in the value segment of the market or the middle segment of the market, meaning the Chinese brands aren't in the premium space for the most part. So this is the only major market in the world where if you go into the China market, you're not going head to head against a domestic competitor. The international brands tend to dominate the premium and the super premium and the luxury segments of the market. The domestic brands will dominate the middle market segment. So you can charge into China with a specialty skin cream or apparel item, and you can do very, very well in that market because you're not going head to head with the domestic brand. You might be going head to head with a Japanese brand or a Swiss brand or somebody else, but at least you won't be facing that domestic competition. Now, based, based on everything that, by the way, did you check out what uh, Rich Wong was talking about? Did you catch the live shopping discussion? I did not. Sorry, sorry. I'm just just moving. So Ooh, okay, yeah. all right. So I, I deliberately avoided getting into the details of single state because I knew that you know you yeah. were probably watching that pretty closely by virtue of what you do with export now. Sure. But we learned all kinds of interesting things about live shopping. What is your assessment of what happened on single state and sort of the snapshot of the, the China e-commerce market right now? Yeah, Singles Day was a big success, but the rate of growth was off peak. So it was a huge success. Alibaba, though, was up year on year only something like eight or nine percent. So you'd say, well, you know, that's not an exciting lift, although the base is pretty darn big. The base is, I don't know, the 60, 70, I think it was over 80 billion dollar base. So the, you know, if if Singles Day were a country, just that one day would be like the 10th largest country in the world or something like that. So it's a huge, huge day. It's a day that the whole country has turned into shopping. And I, and I would say it was generally successful this year. Look, I, let, me, let me say it this way. If you go into China, you need a strategy. And distribution is important, but distribution isn't a strategy. Meaning showing up is the beginning of the story. It's not the end of the story. So you need to talk through yourself. What am I going to do as a brand during promotions? What is my philosophy about live streaming? I went during Singles Day... Julie and I went up to New York City because the Diane Van Furstenberg store in, New York, in Manhattan was hosting a China live stream event in their store with models and with Diane Van Furstenberg's granddaughter who's running the store now. 
and they did a fabulous job. But they had something dazzling. They had a they have a great product. It shows very well. They had the models, and they had bilingual presentation right from New York City to China uh, of their products. That was done uh, in the morning, so it was midnight uh, China time, and it was a huge, huge win. So you need to think through: Do we have something that we can televise, that we can show, that we can demonstrate? We work in our company. For now, we work for Abbott Laboratories for one of their core products, Simulac Baby Formula. We did a live stream event from their laboratory in the United States in Columbus, Ohio, with their lab technicians, their scientists, to say, here's what we do for quality control. Here's how we measure. Here's how we test. And it was a great validation mechanism so that the consumers in China could say, here's how we run a good shop in Ohio. It was a huge win for Abbott to be able to do that. Speaking of huge wins, Craig, thanks for joining us. And, and Frank was Frank was doing a wonderful job of telling people about his book and everything that happened on Singles Day. Uh, we've been talking about live shopping and how that relates to all, all, all of this with Rick Zhuang, who was the godfather of live shopping. Um, and we know that you got to jump. So uh, you've got to go in about 15 minutes. And, and Frank, I, I can stick around for a little bit if you can okay, after that sure. to come back to some of the points that, that Craig might make. Um, so first of all, hi, Craig. How are you? I am wonderful. Thank you for having me. Uh, delighted to be here and happy to talk about um, whatever you'd like to talk about. Well, uh, I think we uh, we can get into some China stuff right now. Yeah, like, you know, there's just been a lot of really strange, interesting news coming out of China. On the one hand, you've got the exuberance and everything that we're seeing around things like, like the e-commerce market, Singles Day, although you know, Frank was mm, uh, adding some adding some nuance and detail to the the, the picture, right? Um, and 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 but there's still plenty of reasons for for everybody being excited and why folks ought to be doing stuff there if they can. Um, but uh, what do you, how do you characterize how things are? Because we're also seeing tech crackdowns and that's showing up in things, and then we've got common prosperity. And what does that mean? What is, you know, what is the Chinese flavor of, of social responsibility? Uh, because we hear that and we think one thing and like a lot of things in sloganeering in, in China, there's the Chinese version of what that means. So, so what, do you, what do you think? What's going on okay. with China right now? Terrific, uh, thank you uh, again, Julian. Uh, the first thing I'd say is that the Chinese government is preparing for uh, a big party conference about a year from now uh, at which time Xi Jinping will probably be reappointed uh, as the leader of China. But in preparation uh, for that, there's a regulatory flurry of activities uh, that's really hit hard uh, the tech sector, uh, and social media, um, uh, and uh, gaming, uh, and a lot of other areas that uh, this audience is uh, uh, interested in. Um, so uh, it's interesting to, to think about uh, what the end game is and whether or not this regulatory crackdown will continue in perpetuity uh, or perhaps it is uh, in preparation uh, for the big party meeting coming up in October of 2022. And I don't think we know the answer to that yet. Um, I think that uh, uh, if uh, that, that the crackdown on tech is very well received uh, by uh, the huge middle class of, of China, uh, generally speaking. But there is an economic cost of the regulatory crackdown, and uh, that cost is growing uh, quite significantly. Uh, just uh, yesterday, the SEC issued some new uh, rules, which will make it nearly impossible for Chinese companies to list uh, in, in, in the US. So there's an economic cost here that's growing. Will it grow enough uh, that the government reverses its uh, regulatory assault on tech and media, uh, uh, on uh, influencers, on gaming? Um, I don't know. Uh, I think that we're going to have to wait and see. Uh, 
uh, until perhaps into to next year. But in the meantime, I think that commerce is flowing. Uh, the uh, one one China analyst uh, noted that the Xi Jinping is trying to move uh, China uh, from investing in bits to investing in things or things with atoms made out of atoms as opposed to software. Um, I don't think that this will have a major effect on the e-commerce market. I don't think it'll have a huge effect on uh, consumer goods. Uh, it has not had an effect on American brands. Uh, that's a good thing uh, in general. And Julie, so- may I, may I jump in or of may I just jump in? Uh, First of all, I, I think it was a very good overview, very good summary of where we are. There's a lot of com complications out there, but I loved your last point, especially I was just looking at some numbers for a, a separate report. American U.S. exports to China this year, year to date, are up about 30 percent. That's not a trivial number. So there's there is sort of a, a downbeat moment in the relationship. There's friction out there. There's always that CNN effect of you know bad news gets amplified uh, but boy it's a, still a great place to do business if you have the stamina and the wherewithal to sort of navigate that kind of environment so it's the largest retail market in the world it's the largest e-commerce market in the world and i think you're absolutely right greg they love american brands we for the same reason americans love american brands we make great stuff so uh i'd say you need a certain stamina and a certain backbone to prevail in that market, but boy, the rewards are worth it. Yeah, I and would... I'll, I'll add to that with one just quick, quick little thing. And then, because uh, this is, I feel like this is a great track and I certainly don't want to take up any of the time left uh, needlessly, but you know, the, the reason why I brought that up is is not because of, uh, there's the headlines you can and, and ignore, right? Like they just want attention right now and they'll take any reason to get it. So anything that's on television, no, no bueno. China Twitter is my is, is they've been abuzz with um, the sixth. Uh, why am I spacing on the term right now? Plenum. Yes, the, the, the sixth Plenum. Party. Correct. Correct. Yes. There you go. That's so there's a job. lot that's come uh, out of that, that, right? Yeah. Exactly. Thank you. Um, but you know, there's there's a lot that you know folks are looking at. And you and I were talking about this the other day, where folks are making hay and the sun is shining. Uh, I think. For the folks watching, I'm a booster. I think that we should be doing business in China. I'm, I'm, I'm very much in Camp Frank here, um, but there are things to watch, right? Like the last thing that you want, unless you've just got money to burn as the biggest co companies in the world think they sometimes do, <laughs> is to be a middle player uh, with a middle budget caught in, in the in between the tectonic plates and ground right out. So um, with that, what would you, what would you say is, is worth watching, right? Frank, go ahead. Uh, well, I, I'll say this on your point, Julian, I'm hundred percent in agreement. I, I'd say about 80% of the brands we work with approach China saying, what, what is a reasonable test? What is a reasonable footprint to have in this market, a reasonable ad budget for the first year or so? So we can see where we stand, see a test. So it's a calibrated entrance. About 20% say, I want a big splash. I want to just spend a lot of money and I want to yell as loud as I can and I want the biggest splash I can make. That 20% always makes me very nervous because I said, you know what, there's <laughs> going to be mistakes. There's going to be misjudgments and miscalculations. And it's if you're spending $20,000 a month on digital ads and you make a mistake, you can course correct and you didn't really burn a lot of cash. But if you're spending two hundred thousand dollars a month on digital ads, you're gonna you're gonna burn some money. So I I feel more comfortable with people take a calibrated approach and say, uh, what would it take to have a good looking e-commerce store, good looking e-commerce setup? I want it as good looking in China as it is in the U.S. I want as many products, more or less. U.S. maybe a slightly shrunken version. Then I want to have a reasonable ad budget so I can fairly test the market and let's try that for six months. That's, a, that's somebody who I think has a sound approach to the market, right? It's Odds are it is going to work, but the point is you want to calibrate your expenses so that whatever that revenue picture is at the end of six months, you say, hey, I made the right call. So we always encourage people take an incremental approach, take kind of a toe in the water approach. And as good news comes along, you can keep building out your the number of products, the number of platforms you're on, your ad budget, and you got a good thing going. 
So we'll come back after, back to all this because I think that folks are going to want to pick up your tactics in just a minute here. But I want to make sure that we, because Craig, you, you were getting into some really valuable stuff, uh, sort of in the domestic political side, not only the China domestic, but I think where you're probably going with that is the U.S. domestic too, the place where we can actually do something about this. So uh, signals to watch and things to look for and what's actually happening and what's CNN noise and uh, Fox noise and so on. Um, but but you... one one of the major concerns of our large companies uh, and the, some medium sized companies too is that uh, both governments are making it difficult uh, to send uh, data across borders. And I think that this is where an organization like Frank's is really uh, e extremely useful. Uh, that uh, the Chinese have recently announced and are implementing the personal information protection law, which is a little bit like GDPR, um, but um, has some, some more difficult characteristics. There's, there's also a, uh, a cybersecurity uh, infrastructure law for, for larger uh, companies. And uh, so there's a, a whole uh, regulatory suite of changes uh, that have been um, announced over the last year that are making it uh, difficult for many companies, particularly service suppliers, that have a lot of uh, personal information on their, their clients. Give you an example uh, of that. Uh, if you have uh, a loyalty program uh, uh, as a consumer good, uh, or, uh, consumer branded company, uh, many of those companies are, are becoming a little bit wary about what their obligations are about holding um, that, uh, that personal information in China. Uh, they know that they can't transfer it outside of China without a, 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 um, uh, a license, but even maintaining it in China has to be done within the, the, the regulatory framework that is in place. And that's becoming more costly and a little bit riskier. Um, and indeed, there are some criminal provisions uh, for uh, misuse uh, of uh, data that companies have to watch out for. So this is an area where if you could outsource that to Frank Lavin, you're doing great uh, uh, because it's not uh, an area that many, um, many companies wish to get involved in, unless they have to. What else are, uh, before you have to jump, what else, what other sorts of things are uh, causing, a, you know, folks to just be like, all right, we're, we're having a really good time in China. Things are great for us right now. But that thing over there, well, I got to keep an eye on that. Well, travel has been very, very difficult and, and nearly impossible. Um, and one really does need to get to the market to uh, see how the product is used and really talk to people and uh, uh, check out um, service providers, et cetera. Uh, and, but that's been impossible. So just last night, uh, the Chinese ambassador announced uh, that he would be opening up a green channel for um, to apply for a visa to get into China. I don't personally have a huge amount of expectation that this will be a major shift. I think that uh, quarantines are still going to be required. Uh, but um, anything to make travel easier will be better. Uh, so that's, that's important. Chinese have not been able to travel abroad at all. Uh, and there are many families that have been divided for over two years. And uh, so the expat community in Beijing and in Shanghai is probably about between a third and a half of what it normally is. It's, there's really been an exodus. And I think that the Chinese announced the, the Green Pass travel program now because they fear that a lot of families would come back for the holidays and just wouldn't go back. Uh, and those are, you know, engineers and scientists and chief uh, quality officers and chief safety officers. And uh, so they had to lighten up uh, a little bit. So let's watch this space uh, because I think it is uh, very important. Uh, travel 
the inability uh, to travel back and forth has really set back an awful lot of people. And that may be changing in the near term. What about uh, US uh, domestic politics and how that is affecting the US-China landscape? Is that something that's causing any anxiety in companies doing business in China? Very much so, yeah. Uh, you know, there are two pieces of legislation that I think are very important. The Xinjiang Forced Labor Prevention Act, uh, which would uh, prohibit the import of anything coming out of uh, Xinjiang. There are two versions of it, one in the House and one in the Senate, and we'll see what happens with that. Um, and then uh, the Competition and Innovation Act, which mentions Taiwan 50 times in its 2,400 pages. And the Chinese are very upset about that. Um, and uh, we need to see where that goes. Um, I'm not going to suggest that if it does pass that the Chinese are going to retaliate in any particular way, but they're very sensitive about Taiwan. Uh, and this legislation um, uses inflammatory language uh, that uh, is not going to be welcome uh, in China. Uh, and I am concerned about potential, uh, potentially some American brands being made to feel unwelcome uh, in China as a result of increased political tension. And with that- It feels a little bit like it's a bipartisan thing too. Like, yes, I don't, absolutely. it doesn't sound like Democrats are doing a whole no, lot that, better that's than That's hundred percent correct. That's hundred yeah. percent correct. I, I apologize, I have to go and leave you in very good hands. Thank you very Thank much. You. Good to see you, right. Good to see you. Frank, let, let's, you. let's chat. Thank yeah. you, Craig, really appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, so, um, so the reason I talked about about it like that is because Craig and I chatted a few days ago yeah. and I got the scoop from him and I knew that he had to say some things. And when he said that he didn't have much time, wanted to no, make sure that, that was great. That was great. So, and, so and, yeah. And, and if I may, I just build off of his comment to say, look, there, there's our, I think, legitimate concerns. No businessman likes to be in the middle of anything that's a political controversy. Business people like clear operating environments. They like predictability. They don't want to be in the middle of a fist fight. So if, but that's frankly, that's how a lot of businesses back into e-commerce because they're saying, look, I can have a, I can have reach in China without any personnel in China, without any, I don't need to set up a legal entity in China. I don't need to hire anybody in China. I don't even need to go to China. This is simply a sales window into the market. It covers a huge swath of the China retail segment. And maybe that's all I'm going to do for the next few years is have an e-commerce uh, sales channel to China and that's it. So that's not a bad compromise, if you will, from the people saying, I, I don't want to end up with having to take regular trips to China. There's COVID quarantine concerns and other things out there. Let me just do the e-commerce approach. So uh, let's see. Now he was talking about the uh, data and privacy and loyalty programs and things like right. that. Let's deal with like the tricky things that people may not know that like either they hear about this stuff and they're like, I don't know if I should be getting into China because of that, but they're like, but then someone like you exists. Yeah. And by the way, I, if, you, if, if this is your first time watching your first time watching me talk to Frank. Uh, so not only is he an e-commerce guru when it comes to China and really knows the stuff about how to operate on the platforms and what to do there from everything from like secret shopping programs to like, you know, where to put your stuff and the advertising and all the rest of it. But like, I, I mean, he was uh, the APAC public affairs leader at Edelman. He was the undersecretary of commerce for international trade, the former US ambassador to Singapore. Um, and before, you know, other corporate experience involved, you know, broad regional APAC stuff with, um, Bank of America, City, what was it, CBRE or, or Cushman Wakefield? Cushman Wakefield, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. So you're dealing with someone who really, really knows a lot about what happens when you get on the wrong side of these things because the, the Undersecretary of Commerce is basically the, like the Secretary of State for the US business community. <laughs> this dude, it's like if you're really getting it and you are one of the, you know, the Fortune 50 and something's keeping you up in the middle of the night, you call Frank. Yeah, uh, in that role. So, but but I'd say this on a commercial side, the laws in China are not extraordinarily different or exotic, but there can be differences. But but you know it's it's got a normal kind of commercial code for the most part. So you normally won't find uh, get into problems. Uh, but for example, if you're bringing products in market, 
They have to be, they have to go through customs. They have to be declared. You have to pay a, a, a tariff or duty if, if applicable. If there are food items that you want to sell in country, it has to be tested and labeled. Uh, cosmetics, anything touches the skin has to be tested and labeled. These are, but these are all regularized activity. Now, I would say there's someone who's worked in both jurisdictions, the Chinese regulations in this regard are no more difficult than the EU regulation, right? But you just have to go through a process. Now, the good, the one advantage China has is in the e-commerce space, there's a channel known as cross-border e-commerce. So you have two choices. You have domestic e-commerce or cross-border e-commerce. Domestic e-commerce means you're fully importing everything into the market, labeling, testing, approval, localizing everything and selling it. So it's a local transaction with the product already imported. Cross-border e-commerce means the product's not brought into the market. It's an individual in China purchasing from overseas, so to speak, and it's brought in. That doesn't have a labeling requirement or a testing requirement. Right. It's no different that if you as an American citizen right now in the U.S. went to Amazon.fr, the Amazon France website, and you saw something on that website that wasn't available in the U.S. and you purchased it with your credit card, you could do it. It would be shipped in from France and it's perfectly legal. But that French company doesn't have to meet U.S. labeling requirements for these one off transactions. So China has that same mechanism. Well, this is enormously helpful to the mid-tier U.S. brands who say, I want to get the China market, but I don't want to spend the next three to six months working with the regulatory authorities to get my product approved. Let me first do a cross-border channel. Let me first see where the market is, what products people like. And then as that market matures a little bit, then I'll migrate in country and I'll have a domestic e-commerce platform as well. Yeah, you know, I, I see a lot of people, I, I, and this came up with my session with Rick, which is like, um, there's a lot of, so, you know, on the one hand, there's like, there are these weird varieties of, um, I know there's a better term for it, but Orientalism, right? Uh, where it's it's a subjectification to uh, say something about yourself. And uh, in this case, it's a little bit holding yourself back because assuming that everything's going to be different and it's got its own rationales and reasons uh, that you will not understand, could never understand, and it's Chinese. And uh, you know, well, there's fear China. of the unknown. There's fear of the right. unknown, which I think is legitimate. So you'll run into something businesses. specifically about China. Yeah. Well, you're right. The more well, look, a, a lot of U.S. businesses have this way pervasively. But you're right. At least there's some familiarity with Mexico. There's some familiarity with France. There's somebody who went there. You know, so it, it, that culture and the language gap just isn't as big. It's somewhat accessible. People have been there, traveled there. But when you get to China, it really drops off a cliff for most people. Much less familiar, huge language gap, cultural gap, very different political system, really a fear factor out there saying, what in the world am I getting into? But you know, I hate to say it, but that's great for us in our business because people are much more likely to outsource to say, I want to hit the China market. Uh, I don't feel like going to Shanghai once a quarter to make friends. Let me just find a firm I can work with that they'll run the whole e-commerce store for us, right? And I can outsource all of that work to somebody else. So it's it, it works out well for us, I have to say, even, even if it impedes some other activities. So uh, what would you say is the thing that you want people to know the most about the space that you watch the most, which is China e-commerce? Uh, what should people be looking out for <clears throat> for 2022? How should they be preparing right now? Like, if we're getting ready, we're going to take the holidays to think about some things, watch what happened with Black Friday. Well, I, I, would, day. Like, I would how, definitely. How should folks be strategizing? I, I've got two or three thoughts. One, I would definitely do some market research, some competitive analysis to say, does my product or similar products exist at all in the China market? What is the typical demand? Is it talk, talked about on China social media? Is the gray market activity? So I try to understand the lay of the land for. Uh, our, our product. And we were just finished a study, for example, for a uh, women's uh, lingerie brand, a fabulous brand. Everybody here will know this, but they make some distinctive products that are much more popular in the West than in the East. And that's just a cultural norm. But it, so we had to try to evaluate would, would their product, core product slate be more? Well, there's no doubt that it, that product get more and more accepted as education grows and as affluence grows, that they like the Western apparel products, uh, e even with regard to lingerie. So, but I do some initial study and that's one point. Two is I think you have to have somewhat of a differentiated product, meaning China is the largest retail market in the world. It's also the most competitive retail market in the world. If you're going in with a generic product, 
an undifferentiated product. Everybody's got that. Everybody, there's 20 different people in that space. Watch out. Then there's nothing special to say about yourself. You have to have a story. You have to have a brand narrative. There has to be some special appeal to your product, your brand that gives it a little bit of sizzle, right? And we, what we ask ourselves, Julian, when we talk to brands, if I bought this product for myself or if I received this as a gift, would I tell my friends about it? The, is there social media currency for this product? Is there something intrinsically exciting about this that it becomes part of the conversation? So you have to have a product that passes that test. And now you've got something special to say to the Chinese consumer. Is there anything special about what's come in the last few months that, because I know that a lot of folks on here are, so we've got some folks who haven't been in, we've got some folks who are in and, you know, trying it out. And then we've got a few gorillas that are like, yeah, but like, what do I, what would the former undersecretary of commerce for international trade tell me that no one else can about what just happened? Because they focus on it all day that I, I can only know that, 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 that I should be thinking about like for the next year, because you just see so much and you know what to look yeah. for. And, well, and well, also I'm, you've got, you've got a wonderful way of sorting sense out of nonsense, right? When people I, come to you and they're like, Hey, yeah. should we be concerned about tariffs? You're like, no. Yeah. You well, know, you're not. That's yeah, not but, make but, but look, 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 let me make a general point. Let me make a general point. The serious brands have an international strategy. The serious brands that are growth oriented say, I've got a product I'm going to take to new markets. That's a fabulous journey, but, but it is a journey, meaning you're going to find whether it's Canada or, or Spain or China, you're going to say, my costs have gone up a little bit. I'm on a learning curve. I've got inefficiencies here. I've got new advertising expenses. I've got a deteriorating ROI. You've got to stick with that journey to make it happen, right? So you're going to find that in any market you go into that you've got to be prepared for a long-term play. Let me, let me say this way. How 3,000 shoe companies in the world, Philip Knight said, yeah, but I'm going to make Nike a global brand. 10,000 coffee shops in the world, coffee chains in the world. Yeah, but Howard Schultz said, watch me what I'm going to do with Starbucks. So they had something internal to them that they, their DNA, their corporate culture that said, we're going to make this work in new markets. Meaning what, what I wouldn't say to somebody, what's important about this, what's, what's less important about this is to say, yeah, there's uneven behavior in foreign markets. Every market has different costs, different benefits, different opportunities, different regulatory environment. That's a given, that's a given. But what about you and your company? Can you navigate that? Can you make the most, can you optimize within that system so that you're still making money in Canada. You're still making money in Mexico. You can go to China, right? So it has a lot less to do about saying, well, I, when is the Canadian regulatory environment going to improve? The correct answer is, I don't know. And I don't care. There are 50,000 US companies making money in Canada currently. They're not waiting for it to improve. They're making money as they can. So you, know, you ought to be able to make money in Canada if you have a good product, a good brand, and a good can company. But I would say that's a global statement. That yeah. regardless of what the international behavior is like, you can find some success in these markets. So a lot of it has to do with, can you adjust your cost structure? Can you adjust your product slate? Can you adjust your pricing? Knowing that every market's going to be a little bit different, you want to capture the opportunity in every single market. I've seen you deliver that comment at just the right time in so many different contexts. You know, that, that's what I'm saying is like, I see a lot of people sweat about the wrong things and you just really good at finding them when they're doing that. Um, final question, marketplaces uh, versus D2C. What do you see with this trend? It's been something that's been coming up quite a bit today. M marketplaces versus what? D2C. D2C. Listen, let me tell you something. That, that, I, I, would, I would say this. You're going to start with one sales channel and then you're going to go to multiple sales channels. In China... Because of consumer culture, it is overwhelmingly a marketplace uh, uh, environment. Something like 90% of sales are marketplace. And what is this? Why did we get there? With, what is the consumer culture that pushes this way? It's because it's a protective device for the consumers. If you want to sell on the major platforms like Alibaba has Tmall, JD is the second largest consumer channel. If you want to sell on these major consumer channels, the channels themselves filter out the black market, the gray market, the knockoffs, the ripoffs, so only off that, meaning if you, want to, if you want to sell Nike products on Tmall, you can only do that if you are Nike or the authorized agent of Nike. 
But if Julian, if you and I somehow buy a thousand pairs of Nike sneakers in Los Angeles and we run to China, T-Mall and JD will say too bad, too bad. We will only let Nike run the Nike store. So it's great for consumers to say, I can go to T-Mall, I can go to JD and I'm talking to the brand itself. I'm talking to the official product, the official brand store. So it's an authentication mechanism, protective mechanism for the consumer. So overwhelmingly in China, the marketplaces uh, are the preferred channel for the brand. I would tell any brand who's in that market, go ahead and set up a marketplace store. You can also have a .com in China be a .cn store, but that's mainly for informational purposes, your brand story, store locator map, add some videos, product specs. It's mainly informational communications. It's not mainly for transactions. So you are at loggerheads with a couple of folks today and it's gonna be interesting to see. Are, are you free right now? Because uh, we're gonna do this uh, after party Q and A. We've got Rick Zhuang who is uh, behind so much of the live shopping boom and Jaggy Zhu who uh, was an early success story for PNG uh, in live shopping and e-commerce in China, uh, then went to ByteDance and TikTok. And um, if you're around, like yeah. I, I, I was gonna tell everybody, look, I've been going since like before 9 a.m. I've got to take a quick break. Uh, I'm gonna send out an email to everybody and tell everybody that I'm gonna be back in about 15 minutes. So we're getting started at like 12, 15. But, um, but if, if, if you're around, I'd, I'd okay. be curious to know what, what, how you, you find yourself in this mix uh, and to meet everybody and hang out for a second. That'd be great. And yeah, I, I think it'd be fun for everybody to meet. So, um, so I'll bid everyone adieu for now and I'll see you in 15 minutes. See you in 15, uh, excellent, thanks. Frank, thank you so much, you're always thanks, awesome, you're, you're the best. Thanks thank you. buddy, appreciate it, thanks everybody.